Hey guys, Dustin said, my name is Steve. Um, I'm so excited because I get, I get to work with Dustin and so I'm, I'm out here about once a month and, and I get to do the opening and closing, but it's the first time I've ever got to come and just share a little bit more with you. And I went to Dustin and I said, Dustin, man, thanks for letting me come. And he had this strange look on his face. I said, oh, Wayne made that decision about me coming and not you. And he said, well, well, he asked me, would it be okay if Steve came? And you know what Dustin said? Sure, that'd be great. We'll get to Culliver's early. <laughs> I have a reputation of being brief. So hang on just a little bit and we'll be finished. Second nature is our... Um, study that we've been going through the series this and second nature last week Dustin talked about prayer and I asked him again if I could uh, just kind of recap that just a minute and then we'll jump into what uh, is set up for today um, Dustin talked about making prayer personal last week and I wanted to share with you guys how how that happened in my life how prayer became so personal um, my wife and I were missionaries in California for a couple years right out of college, and we came back to South Carolina. I was working part-time at my home church as a student minister. They hired me full-time, and my pastor asked me if I would wait. I was so excited, ready to go to seminary, want, just wanting to learn more and more, and he said, could you wait a year? And I said, sure, that'd be great. We got church was going extremely well. But we had this course um, that we did at the church, a study course called Master Life. Some of you, uh, I saw people at the first service shaking their head. They'd heard of Master Life. It's 12 weeks talking about spiritual disciplines and just really digging into it. And so I went through that. About midway through that, they have what's called a half a day of prayer. And when they said we were going to do a half a day of prayer, I'll be honest. I was a little bit nervous, half a day of prayer, I, and I've prayed 15, 20, 30 minutes, but half a day? And, and I wasn't sure what that meant, you know, a day is 24 hours, right? So 12, no, it, 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 was, it was about four, three, four hours uh, in, in the mor one Saturday morning, and they give you the tools to go through a guided prayer time. And God spoke to me in such an incredible way during that time. And he, he, he taught me specifically two different things that he really was challenging me with through that time. The first was um, fasting. I, I, I'll be 100% honest. I knew nothing about fasting. And God told me I was supposed to do it. And so I went to my pastor and I said, look, I know nothing about this, but through our half day of prayer, God's really telling, challenging me with fasting. So very wise pastor, and he set me down, and he taught me. And we went through uh, why the biblical reasons for fasting, practical application of how we do it, and then what God could do in my life. And so my pastor and I started fasting once a week and it, it, for exactly one year. And I can't tell you how much God, how God spoke to me through that one year and how he used it in my life. And, and I'm honest with you, um, I, I have not fasted every single once a week since then. But about seven years after that, I was at First Baptist Simpsonville and I was discipling a college student. And he came to me and he said the exact same thing I said to my pastor. He said, can you explain to me about fasting? And so I set him down, and I, I just went through practical application, the whole nine yards. And he looked at me, and he said, I really believe that God's calling me to that. And I told him about my experience. And so he and I started fasting and praying once a week. And it was almost, again, almost a year, just short of a year. And we were praying for this church, we were praying that God would give us unity. When I came to Simpsonville, we were running about 500. 
and he unified this church. He, he got this church excited about praying and being on fire to pray. And God used, has used us in an incredible way through the years. So that, that was one thing he told me was about fasting. And the second thing was being consistent in quiet time and reading my Bible. Now, I'd been a missionary. I had felt like I'd done a decent job, but God was challenging me to be more consistent and reading his word on a regular basis. So that's what our topic is today. Um, we have two questions. If you would, turn with me to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Turn in, turn on your Bibles, look in the app. There's two questions today and uh, a couple other scriptures that I want to pull in. Scripture that's there in the app as well. But if you would, just let me pray as we get started this morning. Thank you, Father, for uh, just the chance to open up your word. I pray, Father, that you would uh, just move me out of the way and that you might speak to your people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the first question this morning, why should I read the Bible? Well, it's right there in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. His word comes from God, and it's for teaching, reproof, correction, and training. It comes from God. It's not something that man wrote it, inspired by God, by the Holy Spirit. It is for teaching. It, one thing I love about this church, it doesn't matter who is standing up here, whether it's Dustin, Wayne, any of the other teaching Dallas, they open up this book. And they share with you what God says. Now, we, we, we give a few of our opinions along the way. We throw out some stories about our own life. But everything is based, the reason why we do this, the reason why we have this time is for teaching his word, for reproof, correction. You know, have you ever gone in the wrong direction? Have you ever needed to be pulled back? Have you ever needed Nathan to look you in the eye and say, you are the man, you are the woman who's made the mistake. Has God used somebody in your life like that to open up God's word and show you where you have made mistakes? And for training, uh, discipleship is so important that we not only are discipled ourselves, but we are discipling others. So, why should I read the Bible? Uh, for teaching, reproof, correction, for training. I think about w one of my idols. Um, he just passed away a couple years ago. Um, early in his ministry, a young evangelist named Billy Graham was really struggling. He and uh, other preachers and evangelists of that day with this book. And was it really God's word and was it free from error and Billy spent a lot of sleepless nights struggling and uh, trying to decide what he believed about this and he said he's honest that he's not sure if these are the exact words but this is what he quoted as later sort of what he prayed to God Billy said father I'm going to accept this is thy word by faith. And then he said, I sensed the presence and the power of God as I had not sensed it in months. We've got to settle, each one of us, if we truly believe, is this God's word? Is this, is this our owner man, owner's manual for our life? Are we going to believe and trust it to give us the direction in our lives? So that's the first question. Um, why should I read the Bible? I believe we should read it because it is 
God's Word. It is the owner man, owner's manual. And secondly, how can I learn to read the Bible consistently? So we're going to get a little bit more practical. Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 4 says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures. If we get serious about looking into his word, oh, what he can do in our life. You know, you know there's a lot of emphasis today on physical exercise. And I'll, I'll be honest with y'all, I, I, I was w one of those kids growing up that I, I played every single sport. And I know it's different now, you have to specialize and you do one sport and you do it year round and things are different. But when I, when I was growing up, whatever season it was, that's what we did. And so very physically fit. Kim and I got married and, and I was a student minister so I, I was chasing students around all the time. So I, I, I was pretty fit. and. Then, I, then we had kids, and, and I was chasing them around, and I was coaching them, and I was pretty physically fit. And then my kids got older, and then it was just me and Kim. And then my doctor started threatening me with medicine for cholesterol, for high blood pressure. And I, I said, no, have you ever said no to your doctor? My, doc, our doctor, my doctor is one of our church members. I said, absolutely not. What are my other options? And he said, well, you need to exercise. So I, I started walking. I'd get up early in the morning, and I would walk around the neighborhood. And I did that for a few years, and that kind of stiff-armed the doctor a little bit. Then I went back in for physical a few years later, and he said the same thing, and I was still doing a little bit of exercising. He said, no, you, if you're going to keep from having to take this medicine, you're going to have to really exercise. I said, what do you mean? CrossFit. And I said, now look, <laughs> wait a minute, hold on here just a minute. I had always believed that it was a cult, and I didn't want anything to do with that cult or drink that Kool-Aid. And then all of a sudden, one of my friends gives me a six-month free membership to CrossFit. So how are you going to turn that down, right? Free. And I went, and I drank the Kool-Aid. And for three years, four days a week, I was in there working out at 6.30 in the morning. And probably was as healthy as I've ever been in my life. And about this time last year, um, I had an injury, torn meniscus in my knee. I went to this same doctor, and he sent me to an uh, orthopedic doctor. And that doctor, you know what he said? He looked me in the eye, and he did, we did the MRI, and he did everything. And he said, yeah, here's, here's the tear. You got two tears. There's a tear here and a tear here. And he said, surgery. I said, no, thank you. Um, what, my, what are my other options? And he said, exercise, rehabilitation, and all this. And so I said, I choose that. It's not 100%, but it's better. But here's the key in what he said. He said, you are, at that time, you are 56 years old, and you're working out like you're 26. He said, do you know George Bush? And I said, yeah, I've heard of him. He said, when he was a young man, he was a big runner. Then he got a little bit older. He started, then he started riding a bike. Then he got a little bit older, and he started swimming. He said, you have to adjust your exercise according to your age. That one hurt. That one hurt bad. But I, I, I've rehabbed it, and I, I, I still do exercise four days a week, three to four days a week, and, but it's much less than what it would be with CrossFit. I tell you all of that to say, just like 
that physical exercise, being physically fit, the Bible says that spiritual fitness is far more important. 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, take time and trouble to keep yourself spiritually fit. It's not automatic. It takes time and trouble to be spiritually fit, just like it takes time and trouble to be physically fit. Yes, even though I would be at the gym at 630, I would have already gotten up and spent time in his word before I would go. That was a requirement. I was not going to go back on things that God had told me early on in my ministry and laid on my heart that it, how important it was to be spiritually fit. So why do we read, need to read the Bible consistently? It says there in that next verse, spiritual exercise will help you not only in this life, but the next life too. So how, how, how do I get spiritually fit? You're talking about exercise, but how about these spiritual habits? How do I exercise them? They have done studies about successful people, and the difference between successful people and non-successful people is the difference in the habits that they form in their life. The same thing is true with Christians. I think if you're serious about being spiritually fit, you must consider at least reading Bible consistently, not just haphazardly. We, we all maybe pick it up every now and then and kind of shotgun read something here or there, but are we being consistent in reading his word? So to make it a habit, what, what, what do we have to do to make it a habit? To form a habit in your life, you must... Think about three things, the, the reason, the routine, and the result. Reading scripture during your quiet time with God is the goal. So how do we make that a habit? How, how do we read his word consistently? What's the reason for a quiet time? Spending time with God every single day. What, what's, what's the reason? The reason's for direction. Psalm 25, 4 says, show me the path where I should go. Oh, Lord, point out the right road for me to walk. Lead me. I can't tell you how many times God's given me direction during my quiet time, how he's helped me with a major decision that I had during that quiet time when I was reading his word, opening up, praying, listening to God. He impressed upon me what he wanted me to do, what he wanted my family to do. Most of us uh, in here are in such a hurry that we miss what God's saying to us. And so we need these times just to slow down, to listen for his direction. So the reason is guidance from God. The routine, um, Luke 5, 16 says, Jesus, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. The routine is to get alone. Jesus is our model, uh, and he would he would get alone. And, and few people lived a busier life than Jesus did, but he found time with God, his Father, daily. And that's what the word often in that verse indicates. It, it was a habit. Spending time with his Father. So what's the result? If I find time alone with God to read the Bible and pray, the results in John 15, 7, and it says, If you re remain in me and my words remain in you, then ask for anything you wish and you shall have it. You think that would make you more effective? The results of getting alone with God is God's help. God says, I want to help you. Over 20 times God says, ask. You ever wonder, should I read the Bible or pray first? I, I submit to you this morning, you should do it all at once. P pray, read the Bible. As you, as you read and talk to God, just ask him. You know, exactly what does that mean? What, what are you trying to tell me? What do I need to do? What's the next step for me 
and for my family. So what's the best time to get alone with God? There's a lot of different opinions on this one. The best time to get alone with God is when you are at your best. And that varies from person to person. So, some people um, hit the ground running. They, they don't need any caffeine. They just wake up and it's let's go. There's others who don't believe in God till after lunch. <laughs> and, and that's okay. Everybody's different. And I think throughout your life, there are different times that where you are at your best. I have a witness with me here today. Years ago, I, I would stay up all hours of the night and just happy. And now, if it gets to be 10 o'clock, it's time to be asleep. She looks at me many nights and says, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to bed. I'm tired. My alarm never goes off anymore. I wake up, and I get to spend time with the creator of the universe. How, how incredible is that? I, I think it, it does change throughout your life. When, like I said, when I was in college, I, I would always do my devotion in the evenings and read the Bible and pray. And now I, ha I have an accountability partner, and he and I disagree on this fact, but he thinks you have to do it first thing in the morning. I disagree with that. I believe that God can bless any time as long as we put, set aside time to be with him. So... How do we do it? Basically, how, how, do, how do I read the Bible and pray to make, it, make a difference in my life? I'm just going to submit to you a couple practical things that I think. First is make it enjoyable. Um, if you're reading something that you don't understand and the words are from 15th century, then probably not going to understand it. And then you have to look up what it means and Dustin, I, either one, we'd be happy to tell you about different translations and things that are very readable, where you would enjoy reading his word and being able to pick out those things that he is leading you to do in your life. So make it enjoyable. Find a Bible that's um, easily understandable to you and that you, that you can read. And then this next one's hard. Um, for me, because I was the, the worst ever at it, is journal regularly. And I'll tell you what, tell you what I mean by that. Um, when I was in that course in Master Life, that was the first time in my life that I had ever really journaled much. Some, some things with student ministry where we would challenge kids to, to keep up with, you know, reading scripture and then what it means to me and, and how, I, how am I going to apply this to my life. But I had just never been consistent. Master Life, I did it for that, that, those 12 weeks with that course. Then there's Master Life 2 and did it again. And then never had any traction on a journal. And then our pastor in 2005, and I know this because I went in my office and I have a section on one of my shelves of journals, about that many, from 2005, he challenged us, would we journal for the next 30 days? And so if my pastor challenges me some, of course I'm going to do it. So I started journaling in 2005, and um, other than maybe a day or two here or there when I've been sick, every single day. And that changes exactly. I, I look back and I thumb through a couple of them just so I could honestly, with integrity, tell you what it said. This first, in 2005, a lot of times I was just kind of writing out a prayer. And then at other times I, I looked through and, and I saw just really um, talking about what God had told me through Scripture. And then now most recently... Um, basically praying for people. Um, our pastor, Wayne, challenged us uh, a couple years ago. He said, I really want all of the staff praying for our staff. 
And so, I mean, again, my pastor told me to do it, so I, I started praying. And Dustin Sloan, I pray for you guys every single day. Um, there's more staff. Uh, Jen was in here earlier. Blaine, Blaine basically is staff, in my opinion. Je Jeb, uh, Jack. I pray for I pray for our staff every single day, um, and I it helps me to to write it to write down your name in that book, and then I each one I know something's going on different with their family or whatever. I I pray specifically. Make it enjoyable. Journaling helps keep me focused, and that's part of my ADD, I guess. But here's my challenge to you guys this morning. Um, I challenge you to be persistent. Don't give up. You, you know, I, I, I used to be a former student minister, and a lot of times students, they would they'd say they were going to get closer to God, and they would start reading their Bible, and they'd read one day, and then they'd miss the next day, and then They'd try again, and then they'd miss a day, and they'd just give up. And my advice to them, for those students who were struggling to try to make uh, reading God's Word in quiet time something that was important in their life enough to make it a habit, I would say, just think about it this way. If you, if you miss a meal, do you quit eating? No, you probably, the next meal, you probably eat even more. So don't give up. Be persistent. Get into his word daily. Find, find that time. Find that sweet spot for you where you can get alone with him. And here's the result. God's going to bless you and your family, give you direction. And my, la my, my one last thought is spending time with God and reading his word will increase the quality of your life. Money back guarantee from Dustin on that one. There's no doubt if you will commit to it. And I, I look around the room and I, I know there's many in here that's been uh, reading the Bible and studying it long before I ever did. And I know there are many in here who are kind of in the middle and kind of read it sometimes and struggle with making it a habit. I know there are some who journal extensively. I don't know where you are. But here's my challenge. My challenge is that you would take whatever the next step is. Spend a few minutes reading his word each day. Get to the place where maybe you feel comfortable journaling. Spend time talking to the Father on a regular basis. I promise. It will increase the quality of your life. It will give you more wisdom that comes directly from God. It will help you with direction for you, your career, your family. I promise. Pray with me. Thank you, Father, for your word. Truly living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Thank you for the wisdom that you give to us freely and generously through it. I pray, Father, that each one of us would take that seriously. Spending time with you. Listening to you as you speak to us. Thank you for challenging me so many years ago to be consistent reading my Bible and praying. I pray, Father, that uh, if anyone in here wants that accountability, Father, that they talk to Dustin or myself. Lord, we'd love to help and challenge them to a closer walk with you. I pray in Jesus' name.